we have a writer I am very excited about who wrote two original pieces for our show tonight. She's had essays and reported features in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and GQ, among others. Please welcome Rachel Syme. So, here's one of my favorite New York mirror stories. And before I tell it to you, I should preface it by telling you three things. First, it happened five years ago. Secondly, I wasn't there. And third, nobody died. And nobody was even seriously hurt, although an ambulance was called to the scene. So I mention this so you can feel less stressed about what I'm about to tell you, which is that about five years ago, almost five years ago today, on a frigid February morning, about 50 blocks south of here in Soho on a cobblestone street, a giant mirror, 10 feet by 8 feet, which in Manhattan is considered the size of a generous studio apartment, <laughs> fell from the wall of the chic brasserie Balthazar and clattered onto several tables below where patrons were eating croissants and drinking espresso out of demi tasse cups. Maybe fell is not quite the right word. It, it would be more accurate to say that it slithered off the wall or slinked away from it. Eyewitnesses to this event told the press that the whole thing seemed to happen in slow motion, that they heard the wall crackling and the glue peeling off the wall minutes before the mirror detached, like twigs snapping in a forest underfoot. They gave them time, this gave them time to, as the reporter would put it, scurry away before the 10 foot by 8 foot piece of mirror came down. Amazingly, the mirror did not shatter. It did not even crack. It just lowered itself down like an exhausted drawbridge, <laughs> down from the place where it had been hanging for 20 years. Now here's my favorite part. For a moment, right after the mirror fell, the restaurant, which if you have ever been inside it, you know is one of the very loudest places in all of New York City, <laughs> was completely quiet. You could hear a pin drop. This monumental thing had happened. I mean, essentially a piece of the sky had fallen, right? And for a collective moment, everyone, 180 people, chose to acknowledge it. But then, this being Manhattan, the moment was quickly over. Suddenly, silverware started clinking again, job interviews continued, couples ordered another pannier basket for the table. With the exception of one man, who was a 52-year-old French economy minister who had to be taken to Bellevue to get checked out for a concussion after the mirror clipped his head. And again, he was fine. Every single person stayed in the restaurant to finish their escargot. <laughs> By noon, according to the New York Times, there was already a 40-minute wait to get a seat at the bar. <laughs> the newspaper interviewed a Czech woman who had come in for lunch with her husband to celebrate recently becoming an American citizen. And she was shocked to learn the crash had happened just that morning. That was today, she said. I thought you were talking about something that happened last week. The only sign that something bad had taken place that morning was, of course, this big felled piece of glass which remained on the table for the rest of the day. And now I love this story because even though I wasn't there when the mirror fell, I knew that mirror. And I felt that mirror knew me. See, about 10 years before the Balthazar crash, when I was in my early 20s and I was working long days for low pay as an assistant in a magazine, I moved into this grubby apartment on the Lower East Side. And I found it on Craigslist. I rarely saw my roommate. He was this junior fashion editor who went out dancing most nights until 2 AM and still had the stamina or maybe the right chemical cocktail to wake up in the morning and drag himself at dawn to photo shoots. In my head, I started calling this phantom roommate ballerina tea because that was the only item of food he would allow to be in our kitchen. And for those of you who are un unfamiliar, ballerina tea is this green tea blend that has both appetite suppressing and laxative qualities. <laughs> it became clear to me early on that our kitchen was not going to be a place for cooking. When I opened the oven, I found a dead cockroach there. <laughs> and this didn't bother me much. See, I stayed so late at the office most nights that I ate there or I grabbed a sandwich on the bodega on my way home from work and I ate it in my room alone watching DVDs at the OC. This is dating me. <laughs> <laughs> These were lonely days, but I didn't experience them as lonesome. And I think that was because I started taking myself to breakfast at Balthazar. 
See, Balthazar opened on Spring Street in 1997 in a building that used to be a tannery. It was supposed to evoke the spirit of the bustling bistros of Montmartre, but it became this distinctly New York place. It was impossible to get a reservation, which you could only do by calling a special phone number. Balthazar quickly became the hot new spot without really offering anything new at all. As one advertising executive who ate there several times a week put it, everything is right at Balthazar. Nothing is original, nothing is magnificent, everything is just right. And I can't really think of a more perfect way to describe a certain kind of New York establishment, right? Anna Wintour ate breakfast there with Roger Federer and Sarah Jessica Parker. Yoko Ono liked the frites. The food critic Amanda Hesser, who didn't even particularly like the food, once wrote that everyone who has a grievance, myself included, returns again and again, even after a bad oyster. I started taking myself to Balthazar alone on early mornings, where I could get a seat at the bar and eat a poached egg, and gaze across the space into that large mirror. This was actually the best vantage point for seeing everything that was going on in the restaurant and imagining that you were part of the noise, like an essential part. I would see myself, this small blurry brunette dot in the Malay, and I would feel that someday I was going to arrive. I did this for about a year before trundling off to my cubicle. And then I moved to Brooklyn, to a new subway line, and I stopped going. And time went on, and then I found reasons to go back. I started writing profiles, and a lot of the people that I interviewed wanted to have breakfast. Where else? At Balthazar. <laughs> but by then, the restaurant was pretty much full of tourists looking for celebrities, and the celebrities had moved on. By the time the mirror fell, it felt like the party was over, or at least in that awkward stage where a few people are staying to drink the good scotch and kind of wish they would just go home. <laughs> when I first heard about that mirror falling, my first reaction was relief, and not just because I heard nobody was seriously hurt. I thought about the places that we so longed to see ourselves, and how a looking glass that once made us feel beautiful and glamorous can begin to warp and look silly like a mirror inside of a fun house. We all have mirrors like that, where we once look to see ourselves as part of something. But real life doesn't happen inside a mirror. Real life is what happens when the mirror falls. Thank you, Rachel.